So thanks first of all to, for inviting me and I'm happy, happy to see so many people, many are people that I know, I think. And um, uh, my name is Michael Scheel. I'm a radiologist here at the Charité. And I'm also an, a researcher in the group of Friedemann and Paul, where I take care the, of the MRI imaging and the MRI analysis. And I'm happy to give you a somewhat overview talk on how do we do imaging of MS lesions with an MRI, mainly from a clinical perspective, but, but then also from a rather some more detailed research stuff. But that's going to be a very background and introductory talk, because I think most of you are not familiar either with MS nor with MRI. Right? Is that correct? OK. So the idea is, so this is like our agenda. I give you a short introductory of MS. Mm, many facts might be known to you. I will then introduce you to some of the imaging tools that we use in the clinic. And hopefully, after the second talk, you get a, a you have your MRI sequence dictionary at hand, and you understand most of the slides that are coming afterwards. And then we go in directly to the MRI imaging of lesions. And what's important to understand MS is that there's more damage than just lesions, and this is important to visualize this as well. Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> What is multiple sclerosis? Um, as you all know, it's an auto autoimmune disease. And many people will forget that it's a progressive disease. And it has a large neurodegenerative component to it. It's characterized by this multiple lesions that we know of. And in the English uh, literature, it's called plaques. And what's also still important is that we don't understand MS. We don't understand pathogens, the pathogenesis of it. And we don't understand really the pathophysiology of it. Um, research has done tremendous uh, improvement and uh, in developing many new effective therapies. But nevertheless, MS is a un not understood disease. If you were to ask a radiologist what MS is, you would possibly get some, an answer like this. So MS is characterized by multiple T2 hyperintense lesions that are periventricular located, um, that are, can be T1 hyperintense or not. If you compare this lesion, you can't hardly see it here. But if you compare this lesion or that lesion, you will see that these are T1 hyperintense. And it's also characterized that if you get a contrast agent, some of these lesions will enhance uh, and this will, this will show you, this will visualize that at that site you will have a breakage of the blood brain barrier. Okay. Some epidemiologic effects that you understand that MS is indeed a very important disease. So it affects around 2.5 million MS patients worldwide. And to break this down into numbers that we can actually deal with, so we have around 200,000 MS patients in Germany and even uh, alone in Berlin, around 6,000 MS patients. So you, the chance might be that you see an MS patient pretty much, or even one or two every day that you will walk in the street. You, of course, you don't recognize it because MS has changed from a, a disease that was severely dis 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 disability to, um, you know, would see people in wheelchairs. And now people are, it's rather a chronic disease and um, people are not wheelchair bound. This is because of new effective treatments. And it's an important disease because it's a disease of the young, right? So these are students, these are people just starting their career, and they are affected with a chronic disease that is severely disabling in terms of vision, but also motor function, at least if they are not treated properly. And as you all know, it has a strong female preponderance, so there are twice as many female MS patients than there are as male patients. An interesting fact to MS is that it's not a global disease. I mean, in all countries there are MS patients, but the, um, the epidemiology is very much dependent on where you are, and it's dependent on the latitude of where you are. So there are countries that have a high risk or a high population of MS patients, who are, especially in North America and in Europe, and even if you see here by Greenland and Iceland, they have a much higher uh, MS like, incidence or risk uh, than other diseases, uh, than other countries. So 
ethnicity has a strong background, and that might be not the ethnicity itself, but rather where you are at the latitude. So we have a much stronger, a higher risk in Caucasian people because they live higher in the latitude. Uh, then you will have an, uh, an Asian people or an African people. Then it's important, where have you been in your childhood for your latitude? So the, at the age of 15, it, um, if you move f uh, before the age of 15 to a country where you have a lower incidence of MS risk, so say you, your, your parents are working in, um, in a development country or so, or you're, they're just working in Africa, you just go with them as a kid, then you will have the risk of that country. Okay, so there might be something that we didn't quite understand what's really having, is going on. So the, one of the theories is that, that it has to do with the uh, sun exposure that you get during that time. And vitamin D has been a, an important factor. And another important environmental factor is the exposition to Epstein Barr virus, uh, which is a very common virus most of people have, so over 90% are. Uh, sooner, or later, uh, sooner or later get this, but in MS patients we have 100% of patients that have been uh, exposed, um, that had exposition to EBV. Genetics is of course, uh, of course also an, an important point, so if you have a twin, an identical twin that has MS, your chance of getting it is 25%. If you're a children of an MS page, uh, patient, then you have a chance of 1 to 50 some, uh, like there are a number of genes already been identified that higher the risk um, uh, for MS. And so again, like multiple MS, uh, multiple MS is a multifactorial disease. Multiple sclerosis, what it should be. Okay, so now this is for so much for the background. It's an important disease, as you understand. And now I'll show you some of the imaging tools that we uh, use in our, in our department. So to put you in my position, let's assume you are the radiology resident in the emergency department. And your, your, you know, your colleague, your friend um, also has to, is on call in the neurology department and he, uh, he calls you and he asks for imaging. And so a typical patient would be a female, 25 year old patient that is seeking help for either uh, problems with, um, you know, has, has a numb feeling in her hands or her legs or has a, vision problem, and so the neurologist says, well, he is a suspect's MS, what do you do? Anyone? I think we know each other. What do you do? What's the first thing that you offer to do? MRI. You're the radiologist. MRI scan? MRI Okay, yeah, so what, what, is, what is the other option? What could you, I mean, it's, it's in the middle of the night, no one is there to, you know, work the MRI right now. Anyone? Uh, anyone in the back? I know it. A CAT scan. Yeah. So does anyone know what a CAT scan is? Most of them people know. But these, these, you know, these machines, they look so similar, right? But they are so different. And if you think about what a CAT scan really is, <laughs> it's a... You know, com in comparison to an MRI, it's a rather, it's almost like doing a black and white copy, right? In terms of a full color inkjet printer or some laser printer, right? So for, a, for the CAT scan, you only have this one contrast, which is x-rays, right? So you, you can only do an image, or your contrast is, how do my x-ray beams get uh, attenuated during uh, my imaging? And for the MRI, we just see we have like a multitude of um, different sequences that we can acquire and many, many contrasts that we um, can, can use to visualize our lesions. And I don't know of how many of you would be able to actually see that lesion here. I mean, it's there, right? And um, it's, I think it's, it's even better, to, it's, like, it's easier to see on my screen here than in, on the projection, but I think even on the projection for each of you, it's pretty easy to see that there's something wrong, right? And that's why MRI is our most important and um, also in the emergency setting, um, our most important imaging tool to get a reliable diagnosis. 
Okay, so now we, I hope you do, to get you familiar with some of the MR sequences that we have, because otherwise it will, can, will be kind of hard to understand the images that we're going to see in the, um, in the next slides. Okay, so T1, T2, flare, T1 with gadolinium, diffusion weighted, and time of flight angiography is somehow the basic set that we um, have for a standard MRI of the head. And the, um, the sequence that we need for this talk will be T1 flare and T1 with gadolinium. Okay, so I will ask you in the, after a while, like, what is this? Is it T1? Is it a flare? And I will give you a hint on how to detect and how to get this. Okay, so if you look at this image, you see that the gray matter is somewhat darker than the, than the white matter, right? So you, you, you remember, okay, gray matter is gray and white matter is white. So this is your kind of little hint. And in a, in a flare and also in a T2, uh, in a flare and in a T2, your gray matter is brighter than your white matter. So it's the other way around, yeah? So in a T2 or in a flare, your gray matter is white, whitish, and your white matter is getting darker, okay? And if you want to know, is this a T2, is this, is this a T1 where you had been applied gadolinium before, <coughs> you have to look here where the, where the veins are. So if you see bright spots like these compared with this image, then you know a contrast <coughs> agent has been given. And you would look then for gadolinium enhancing lesions, for example. Okay, does this make sense? I won't go into detail of these two techniques because for MS they are not so important. Okay, our first quiz. Uh, what is this? What is this? Also a flare. Perfect. And this one? T1. And this one? T1 with contrast. Excellent. <coughs> Okay, so now let's try and you know, try to make a link between what we see in the MRI and what we, what we see in an autopsy, for example. Okay, so if you have an autopsy brain here and you see an MS lesion, it's kind of this, have this brownish, grayish appearance, and if that would reflect in that T2 hyperintense lesions, right? Because this is a what? <laughs> what is this? Yeah. A flare, right. Okay, so our lesions are, they are characterized being T2 hyperintense mainly. And if you look into these lesions with the histology marker, we can see that, for example, here, this, <clears throat> this is a myelin staining, and you see this, this lesion is, um, has lost lots of myelin. And if you look even further into it, you see that there are, um, these, this is the normal appearance. This would be how the myelin would, should look like. This is how it looks in, within this lesion. And you see all these cells, which are um, macrophages and T lymphocytes, mainly. OK. The problem, though, is you could say, well, well I mean, that's, a, that's easy, right? I can see, mine. everyone can see that bright spot in the brain. So that's OK, that, that's, a, that's an MS then. But um, unfortunately, these um, T2 hyperintense lesions, they are really unspecific. What do you think is this? Is that an S? It could be an MS, but it's not. It's really not an MS. It has some periventricular lesions, but some of the lesions are also here in the subcortical area. This is a patient that has not MS. That's a patient that has a micro, that has a small vessel disease. Okay, what's that? <coughs> is that an MS? No. Possibly not because I'm asking, right? But, uh, you know, you see all these hyperintense lesions, and we also see gadolinium here. Does anyone have a di differential diagnosis? Maybe from the physicians that are in the audience? Multiple gadolinium-enhancing lesions. Say it again. 
Metastasis. Yes, exactly, metastasis, very good. So that's a metastasis of a, of a breast cancer. And so what makes um, the lesions of a mass somewhat characteristic is not their T2 hyperintensity. It's where they actually are. And so we have to see, where is my lesion? Does it touch the cortex? Um, here, if this lesion is touching the cortex, that's why we call it the juxtacortical lesion. Right? So it's really uh, right beside the lesion. There can also be cortical lesions that are much harder to see, though, because the gray matter of the cortex is hyperintense itself already. And then you have periventricular lesions, which is uh, self expressionary and then you have the infratentorial lesions. <clears throat> and then, of course, there are also spine lesions that I don't cover here. And if you have a patient that has lesions at juxtacortical position, at paraventricular location, and in, at infratentorial location, then your chances that this might be an MS patient together with the clinic and together with the lab results from um, the CSF, uh, you have a high chance that this is an MS patient. What's also important to keep in mind um, is that MS lesions are pure venous inflammation. And how can we visualize if that's a pure venous inflammation, so an inflammation around a vein? That's um, coming more and more common to do a so-called flare star, which is a combination of um, and another technique that can visualize veins um, called SWI or T2 star imaging. And if you combine these two kind of two images, you get um, your lesions with a vein or this dark uh, streak here. Um, and you're pretty confident, okay, this is not a, a lesion around a small artery, but this is a, uh, this is a lesion around a small vein, and which, is make, which makes this much more likely to be an MS lesion. Okay, so what is there beyond lesions? What can we do um, on imaging beyond lesions? Think back of what MS really is. So it's in a, in a disease characterized by lesions, but also a neurodegenerative disease. And as you can see from that patient here, over uh, the imaging of him for many years, you see that he gains certainly a higher lesion load over all these years that we see here. This lesion just came up, and this lesion wasn't, is, is just present on that time, and then disappears again, and so on and so on. But if you look at these images down here, the T1s, you can easily see that this brain makes a strong, has a strong atrophy over the time, right? And it's much stronger than you would expect for someone just during normal aging. So there is a neurodegenerative uh, component to it, and new monitor, disease monitoring um, are trying to implement also um, the amount of atrophy that you would expect for a normal person. And if, if you have a, sp a specific patient, an individual patient, you want to know, is that atrophy over the standard that you would expect? Because we have our treatments, they can control for uh, lesions nowadays quite well, but not so much for the atrophy effect yet. And some people could argue, well, the atrophy is only a epiphenomenon of the lesions. So if you get more lesions, then of course your brain will be affected and you get atrophy. But it's more to it. So despite having um, a control of lesions, there is a neurodegenerative effect. So there is brain atrophy. So there must be another component to it. And if you would be interested of what are the actual locations of where that atrophy is happening, and you do what's called a voxel-based morphometry analysis, you can see that um, the lesions are, uh, not the lesions, but the atrophy is mainly happening here at the occipital and at the thalamus, right? If that's going to be ever, you know, for an individual patient for interest, I doubt that right now, but we will see what happens. Another technique what's, um, that has been around for a while is MR spectroscopy. And if you look into um, MR spectroscopy, which is a somewhat delicate te MR technique and it's not easy to apply, that why, that's why it hasn't been applied in a routine yet, uh, broadly. But it's a very strong uh, technique, so you can measure basically um, tissue, uh, you can measure concentrations of certain meta metabolites like glutamate, and you can, see, uh, you can actually quantify that and you can compare an MS patient to a normal control. And you see that in all MS patients, the, uh, the amount of glutamate really 
highly rises. And this could be, because this is not the case in all neurodegenerative diseases, this could be a more specific marker of MS. I mean, there are other diseases that have the same appearance, but it seems to be a promising marker for MS. And <clears throat> even more delicate in applying is the sodium MR imaging. So if you do normal MR imaging, uh, the nuclei that we image is the proton, right? You can do the same thing though with na natrium or uh, with, no with sodium. You can do the same with the sodium. So what you measure is how much sodium is in that in that space uh, that um, uh, in that brain, and you can see here if you do that, the sodium levels in MS patients they are pretty high also. But that's really not in the clinic yet because sodium imaging you need special hardware. You need a special coil for it, and the uh, uh, signal-to-noise ratio is really, really bad, so uh, for that kind of picture, the patients would have been probably lay in that scanner for 20, 30 minutes or so before you can do that. Okay, so to give a short summary of what we learned is that MS is a highly relevant disease, um, mainly affecting young adults. It's a progressive disease and not quite understood. MRI is our um, favorite tool to do visual, to visualize our MS lesions, and it's an important cornerstone, of, not only for the diagnosis but also for the monitoring of uh, of MS. And although we can image the MS lesions quite well, what we can't, can't really image quite well is the neurodegenerative aspect um, of MS. Okay, so this is a slide that um, I might explain that there is more to MRI that um, or there's there is larger possibilities of MRI than on this um, on this table but I'm happy to answer any questions.